Yes, so this very first screen is uh, showing the reality that is going on in my country right now. I thought originally that I would just talk about syntax and apply this somehow to matter materialism. But what happened basically is that uh, this guy here, Merino, he basically kicked out our president and positioned himself only for six days because then all of these riots that you see of people uh, fighting the, the police force and people demonstrating uh, well, basically um, got him to move out. And so now we have a new president <laughs> and uh, this was selected, uh, this person was selected just today. And unfortunately, uh, two very young boys uh, are now dead, you know, and you have some people that have disappeared. So in this sense, why am I talking about this? It's because, mm, well, <laughs> the world is in trouble. It's not just my country, right? We know that in France, a teacher was beheaded because he showed some, um, I don't know, um, caricatures of uh, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, we, we, I don't need to go through all the problems that we have, but I really value the opportunity of being now and here talking about ethics because it really concerns us all, not only as researchers, but as human beings. And well, in that sense, uh, my presentation <laughs> changed to become syntax, arts and ethics, conjoining Aristotle and Spinoza. And uh, I, will, I will give an account about how these two philosophers can contribute with useful thoughts for us uh, in these two dimensions in, in the arts and the ethics and how this weird concept of syntax curiously enough is very relevant in both so let's start with the first two topics uh, the first one is ethics and the second one the four causes according to aristotle so what is ethics about really i mean um well there are a number of things that we can associate it with right how to live a good life what are our rights and responsibilities what is right and what is wrong um and it can also refer to okay but why do i think that this is right or wrong or why do i think that this is a good life to live you know so uh, revising our own uh, beliefs about how we should act but this is uh, perhaps my point that ultimately ethics for us human beings, I mean, ethics is, I would say, proper of us, right? And, and ethics is related to action as, as subjects that can, uh, that exist in a symbolic world and in a performative world, in a multidimensional world, right? That is intersubjectively given. Uh, so we, we have this awareness uh, to be able to act. And um, I would like to resort to Spinoza's ethic. This is a wonderful uh, book. This very uh, nice man that you see here, well, he was literally damned by his uh, Jewish community in the Netherlands. And uh, this was not a closed, conventional, I don't know, like a super dogmatic community. They were op very open to exchange of ideas, but uh, Spinoza's uh, ideas were just so radical that they, they couldn't cope with them. And I will only present the very basic ones here. Uh, for Spinoza, all is one. I mean, there is the one, right? The one can be called nature, substance, or God, but all is one. So this, this oneness, this uh, substance, is the only thing that exists. And uh, you and me, or, or maybe this pen here, everything is just um, sort of a manifestation of the one, right? A way of understanding the one. Oh, oh this pen is part of the one. It's a mode of this great oneness. And why is this important? Because uh, in this sense, it doesn't, make, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to speak about the individual, right? The individual cannot be the basis of, of action or of existence because everything is one. Hmm? So um, for Spinoza, a good life is about maximizing your capacity of action. This is uh, what we should tend to. And we should be aware because uh, we want to do this in order to become one with the one, right? We, we want to be, I don't know, harmonizing with the world, but we have affects, we have things that are operating on us, that are acting upon us. And we can, 
we can't really remedy this. This this is happening, right? I mean, like uh, coronavirus suddenly just happens, and you have to stay at home, and <laughs> yeah, so it's affecting you. But we have to learn to turn these affects in our favor. And Spinoza is very emphatic about one way of doing this, and this is, of course, uh, proper of his culture and of his time. And he says, well, we need to use reason. We need to understand why and how an affect is acting on us, right? If we gain this understanding, then we can then we can get rid of it, or we can rather twist uh, the affect in our favor, because as the, we have good affects that give us joy and that make us want to act even more, and we have negative affects. For Spinoza, death or sadness are they're the same thing. It's a negative affect that reduces your capacity of action. But then we as artists and uh, as um, art scholars, we could say, right, uh, whether it's music or dance, we know that uh, music, dance, the arts, these are very powerful affects. So we could maybe add and emphasize in the fact that uh, we, we, we have uh, this other way of countering negative affects. And this is <laughs> using the arts, relying on the body, on the sensible, not only on reason. So now let us take a glimpse at Aristotle's four causes. Uh, so we're doing sort of a remix here. Uh, I'm going to take the example of the David statue sculpted by Michelangelo, right? So the David statue is made of marble. And in fact, everyone thought that the piece of marble, which was gigantic, it was more than five meters tall, was useless, right? Because two other artists had tried to sculpt on it and uh, it just didn't work. It, uh, when, when they gave it to him, it was like, here, you know, we would love it if you could do something with this. So Michelangelo takes the matter, the marble, and using his artistic competence, he manages to sculpt this wonderful statue that became an icon for Florence, the David, right? And uh, well, but what for? Well, the goals can vary. We, we really don't know what motivated Michelangelo. Maybe it was that he wanted to do something truly great. Maybe he wanted to do something for his city. Maybe it was about pleasing the commissioners and getting paid. Many possible reasons, but the what for is a really important aspect. And another thing that we have to realize is that we could uh, think about this example as saying this piece of marble that is more than five meters tall, this statue, which is the David, this competence, Michelangelo's competence to, you know, transform one into the other for this sake. Or we can also think in, in terms of universal, you know, you have sculpting is about having uh, some material. It's about having a competence uh, that is um, like the, the mediator from the material to the ultimate form, to the statue, and there is a purpose, right? Uh, that for the sake of which we are doing something. And, well, you, you find this in Aristotle's four causes. So the, the, the primary cause for Aristotle, the, the driving force, is the final cause, the telos, right? The end, the that for the sake of which. Then we have the formal cause, which is basically the essence. And I, I like to understand this as a determination of the final cause. Well, what is that? Uh, it's like uh, Michelangelo says, I want to do something that is truly beautiful. Uh, okay, good. I want to do a statue of the David that is truly beautiful. But the end result, this David is wonderful for what it is, right? It has an essence that it's its own. So it is a determination of the final cause, right? It is not as abstract, but it's like grounded. And then we have the material, right? It, it, the material is that which undergoes transformation. It underlies and it endures the change. Uh, the, that from which, and it contributes with its own features, like marble is solid, marble is sort of white, and that's what you see in the end statue as well. And then you have the efficient cause, uh, what is actually, you know, causing this thing from here to become this thing there, so the, the motor. It can be internal in the case of living beings, for example, and in the case of human beings when we act as agents, right? And as we said before, this applies to particulars and universals. So, uh, if we think about uh, ethics in the light of the four causes, if we think about, okay, uh, well, okay, ethics uh, in the sense of living, how would this apply to us? We would have to consider the final cause, right? What sort of reality do we envision? Uh, what are we researching for? 
why do we want this reality to be or this research to become right aristotle said that everything tends towards the good that was his final cause and spinoza says well we should become one with the one right but we have to find our own final cause what is driving us uh, and this is part of the ethical question. And then uh, we need to, of course, to think about the means to achieve it, right? Am I, am I actually achieving this? Um, at the expense of what? Some, uh, well, it is famously attributed to Machiavelli, though he didn't say it as such, like the, the end justifies the means. Or is this really the case, right? So we have to design and evaluate strategies uh, so that we can act. And if we take into account Spinoza, if we take him seriously, we, we will say it is not about me acting, but it is rather about joint action, especially given um, the context of the world today. And then we have to reflect on what we have at hand. What are our materials? You know, what, what sort of thing? What are my resources? What can I use to make this transformation actually happen? Uh, and this can refer to everything, not only material things as we usually uh, refer to the physical world. A material can be anything. It can be maybe our intelligence, it can be our, our interests. There are a number of things that can count um, as materials, right? And then we have the form. So if the form is the determination of the final cause, it is something more grounded. And we say, well, what does this new world look like? And this is a critique, actually, to, to many of the accounts that I find when we talk about decolonization, deconstructing, always emphasizing the D, right? Uh, and, uh, and you have these notions which are useful, but useful for something such as privilege, right? Are you being privileged? Right? But okay, in the end, what sort of world do we want? You know, what is the possible positive content of transformation what concrete goals do we have what is what is the the what is it that we are asserting we know what we don't want what do we want then right so this this is what form would account for so now let us go on to our next topic which is syntax syntax well here we have an infamous infinite monkey right this is a thought experiment i know it from borges but i, I know that he didn't post it but give uh, a monkey or even uh, more funny if you could infinite monkeys uh, everyone with their typewriter and you give them infinite time and they're immortal then they will have written everything that can be written right from hamlet to don quixote to you know whatever that is translatable into into the alphabet right with commas and periods and so on and james joyce and all of the great classics of literature the infamous monkey but then again they will have written uh, all of these because they will try every possible combination um, that the language will allow. And this means that they will produce an enormous amount of garbage, right? <laughs> so to find the Hamlet in one piece, one would have to search uh, in the middle of a lot of garbage. And that's why, because, you know, they have no rules to see what counts as valid, what would make sense, linguistically speaking, or not. They just have the materials. They just have the alphabet characters, the minimal elements from which um, a piece of writing can be composed. And so a uh, monkey can say, I love music. Uh, they will write something absurd as music love I, or uh, we, we know that in language we can say, I love banana. I can substitute love for want, right? I want banana. I can substitute I for you, you want banana. But maybe, you know, if, if, if a monkey, we imagine them just like this, uh, <laughs> typewriting automatas, they will just write things like banana music me I, and we're like, what? This doesn't make sense, right? So uh, in here we have already come to uh, what Aristotle would say on syntax. Oh, here we have three definitions. One way of thinking about it is like, okay, we gave the monkeys a typewriter and then they will try every possible combination as if it were this big block of marble. So what is syntax then? Syntax is a form giver. It will give form. Why? Because it will, it will exclude silly combinations. Because syntax, and here comes the second definition, is about principles that rule the combination of discrete elements. And what results from these rules and from these possible combinations? Well, that you can group them in units, right? I mean, in the case of language, using this analogy, you have letters, you can form syllables, you can mix the syllables up and you form words, you mix the words uh, up and you have sentences, you can mix sentences, right? So you have a syntax in a lot of different levels. And, and this means that this results in different levels of hierarchy. 
Another way of thinking about this third definition would be to say that we have a, sin a system, such as language, right, with uh, the English language, which offers so many possibilities. And now that I am speaking, and when you speak, and or when you see a, a text, and this is the actuality of language, it's actualization, it is language put into practice. And what is the mediator between the two? Syntax. Okay, so this is all very nice, but now we're going to see an example with Zapateo. So uh, let us put a little video. So I am give, I'm going to give a, a little application of syntax and an explanation of what, what it means, for example, in a, in a concrete practice, in the case of Afro-Peruvian Zapateo, which is practiced mostly in Lima, the capital of Peru, and the, and the surroundings. So just a little demo. That's a little demo, Zapatero. Let us analyze a movement sequence that I didn't do. Movement sequences in Zapatero are called pasadas. So, we start with this pasada. Basically, improvisation in Zapatero consists of combining pasadas and sometimes chopping them and remixing them. This is one of the basic pasadas, and it goes like this. Pasada is composed, it is generated by only three movement cells, very compact units. The first one is this one, until there. Second one, three steps. Third one, the joker, because you can fit it in everywhere, like the joker card, yeah? So from this, from these movements, hands, three steps, and joker, you can generate the longer sequence. A variant of this pasada would be here. So we have... Yeah? That's a possible variant. I'll, uh, this would be the second one that I'm showing. A third one, a little bit more complex, would be the one that follows. Here, in, order, in, the, in the number two and number three, I introduce this new cell, yeah, that's the hand to heel, I'm calling it, and the kick, yeah, and there is a variant of this, of this uh, hand to heel, hand to heel two, you could say, uh, which is this one, when I do, yes, so we have those two variants. So as you see, we have these very small cells, which are capable of generating longer movement sequences. So in my case, I'm applying syntax to these movement cells. So, and, and this gives me a lot of possibilities. There are even some that I'm not representing. So there is a lot of possibility of mixture, but the whole improvisational structure is based on these simple movement cells. Now we go back to the presentation. So, well, okay, it's, it's glorious syntax. We have a number of possibilities. We have rules that are uh, ruling out some possibilities and allowing other possibilities. But how could I express this? 
actually computer science has a branch that is especially <laughs> dealing with syntax and uh, this branch has a technique or let us say a theory like formal theory that is called finite state automata right so um together with the dance syntax group uh whom i will acknowledge at the end we are working on applying the finite state automata mm -hmm to dance, to represent. So I can't explain the diagram in detail now, but what I can say is first I said, okay, so we had we have um, we had three possibilities, right? The orange one, then I showed uh, the sky blue one, and then in the end, the one that was more complex and that looks more complex there is the green one. If you, if you look at it, it's just balls and arrows. It's really simple to use, and that's why I like this method very much, because it's it's like uh, graphically not complicated and conceptually very clarifying, and it, it shows what syntax actually is about, right? So we start here, I do the hands motif, and if I repeat, I have a loop. If I repeat twice something like in the end, right? And I arrive to this terminal state. That's the principle of the method. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I trust that it can be a great contribution both to the study of syntax of music and dance. And I see that this method in the context of music is being used uh, partially uh, by people that are computer scientists, uh, but I don't know how much it has been deployed by musicians or by musicologists, right? So this is the idea that we actually get working on the method ourselves. Um, so if we think about uh, how this method is illustrating the syntax, once we have chosen the level of hierarchy in which we want to work, in the case of Sabatovitz motive cells, then we have paths and loops for possibilities, right? We, we have this path mar marked by arrows. We have impossible paths, like when you don't have two balls that are connected with an arrow. When there's no arrow there, it means that it's impossible, right? And this introduces memory when you have, like, when you're at this point, and you say, oh, I could go here or I could go here. In some cases, this depends on what you did already, right? This decision depends on what you did. In that sense, this is a system with memory. We are using our memory when we dance. And on the other sense, a very important aspect of syntax is expectation. Because we know the structures and when we're at a, at a particular point, like um, let us say here, right, in this S3B, then I say, oh, okay, I have this option, so I, I know what to expect. And this is very a very important aspect of the aesthetic experience, right? Of 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 how we experience art forms that we know. So uh, a very enlightening approach that I saw in one of my references, and you will see the references at the end, is syntax in the sense of action. Because comparing the syntax of music to that of language is really hard. But when you look at it from the perspective of action, this uh, it becomes much more clear. So uh, as I said, syntax is related to expectation and memory. Because uh, when we are going to act, if we think about, OK, not just syntax as an abstract, like me trying to improvise in the piano some uh, based on a standard melody if I'm playing jazz right or me trying to dance a pateo or you doing this or that right then we have plans which consist of sub actions and that are hierarchically organized in a meaningful way because we want to achieve a goal a very silly example is I want a cup of coffee I extend my arm I take the cup I bring the coffee to my mouth I incline the cup and I drink right so this is sort of what the plan would be and um, this is a nice way of understanding meaning because we usually say, oh, this means that, right? Like meaning uh, in a representative sense, referring to something else. In this case, no. Meaning is about, okay, I want to do this. What do I have to do in order to do that? And, you know, I, I did this. Am I doing it well? I'm playing the piano. Am, am, I, am I playing the, the right notes or am I improvising gracefully to the bass line? You know, so uh, you, you, it's about assessment of action, right? How What we want to do, what we're doing, and how good are we doing in relation to what we want to do? That's another way of understanding meaning. 
And, um, you know, uh, so we, if you have a different intention of action, then you have different meanings. So in this sense, of course, the, the intention of action in the case of, of the arts is different from language. In language, it's mostly about communicating or asserting things, uh, propositional language. In the case of music, it's about affect. And these, uh, that means that the two are fundamentally different, right? So in this sense, we can understand syntax from a very different perspective. We can say that it's about uh, how the elements that we have stored as cognitive agents and their relations can be translated into sequences. So uh, in this sense, this, this translator is syntax. We have elements in our head, we, we, or in our head, in our body, whatever you want to say it, whichever way you want to construe it in. But you have these elements, and these elements are interrelated in you as an agent, and you're going to translate it into a realization of something. And so this requires your body in order to have action uh, motor control. You're also going to have action planning, as we said. And then you need the sensory motor integration because you need to see, OK, I am playing this. Is this the right note or not? Right. So actually, defining syntax in this way is the same as saying that syntax is competence. Syntax is Michelangelo's competence. Uh, in virtue of which he sculpted the David, right? Uh, syntax is mild David's uh, competence uh, when he wants to improvise uh, when he plays autumn leaves, right? So, so it, syntax as the mediator, this is a beautiful way of understanding it. And it has a direct application to what concerns ethics and art. So we already posed a number of questions in ethics, right? What reality do we envision? What are we researching for? By which means at the expense of what? Uh, in the case of art, we can say, okay, what's my goal as an artist? Which elements am I considering? How are these related to each other? You know, how do I take, uh, what do I take to be my materials when I, when I do art? Um, and in, in this sense, in the context of ethics, it is useful to think about power relations because power relations, uh, Foucault says, is it's about controlling what others can do, their space of possibilities, their syntax, right? So what is the, the job of ethics? It's not only to pose these questions, but to question them, right? We need to ask, and why do I think in this way? The meta-ethical the meta aspect is important here. So what is my stance? I mean, what am I doing myself? Um, well, I, I, I do think that it makes sense um, to, to do research for fun and you can study some very abstract um, subjects for fun, let us say, for your own pleasure. But I also think that we need to devote part of our research to a better society, right? Uh, to, to put our, I don't know, our granito de arena, our, our, our little contribution to making a difference. And I really don't see the point on academia promoting us and engaging us in publishing, uh, you know, how many kilos did you publish this year? You know, how much papers, how many papers, how many pages? So what, what's the point of this? Uh, the, the world reads, uh, needs transformation and papers are useful in the sense that they carry ideas, right? So um, I do engage with Spinoza's idea of becoming one with the one. From my side, I am researching together with um, some Afro-Peruvian masters and, and we're working together on the problem that they care about researching on Zapateo, right? And uh, well, little by little, I'm starting to engage more with the problematics of our Peruvian people, right? <laughs> Suffer with this group of discrimination, and it has been even worse. It was worse before, now it's getting better. So what can we do, right, to, to improve the situation? So these are some dilemmas that I wanted to, to bring for you uh, onto the table. And I would really like to acknowledge the people from the Dance Syntax Group, which I must say I started as well, right? It was my idea to apply this method. Method, and we're working with now. Uh, it's Avanti Banerjee, Kavya Iver, Lika, Maria, Marisol, Raimundo, Ronald, Somia, and myself. And you have many countries represented: uh, India, uh, Peru, Mexico, Uganda. The, you know, so uh, many, many countries. And uh, well, I hope that you find this presentation interesting, and and I hope that we can discuss. I will be very happy to answer questions. I know that I've been brought, but I, I felt that it was really necessary to be brought and, and to present a broader picture. Thank you very much.